아무튼 딱 반갑습니다. 독일 살고 있는 고춧가루입니다. 서로 물고 뜯고 싸우다가도 국가의 재난이 다가온다면 한국인들은 힘을 합쳐 싸우는 모습을 보여줍니다. 이번 사건을 보더라도 한국인들은 응집력 있게 힘을 합쳐 국가의 재난을 이겨내려고 하였습니다. 이번 사건을 통해서 선진국 시민들의 양면적인 내면을 들여다볼 수 있기도 했었습니다. 아시아 관계학 전문가 베스타 교수는 조선, 한국이라는 나라가 특별한 이것을 가지고 있어서 일본과 중국과는 달랐고 명나라가 무너질 때 특별한 그것이 한국이라는 국가를 살리기도 했다고 주장했습니다. 하버드 대학에서 진행된 이 강의의 제목은 제국과 의료운 국가로 여기서 의료운 국가는 조선, 그러니까 한국을 칭합니다. 그러면 강의 보고 오시겠습니다. Enjoy. It's wonderful to be here. It's a real honor and pleasure for me to do the uh, Reichshauer lectures here at Harvard. Title for these lectures: Empire and Righteous Nation. There are three concepts that I would like to explore a bit at the start. of the first lecture. Empire, nation, and righteous. Righteous, of course, refers to Korea, but it doesn't mean that all Koreans are righteous, or even that the Korean state at any point or in any form has been a, a righteous state. It's there to indicate that the search for a righteous approach to domestic and international affairs has preoccupied many generations of Koreans very much. Let's then turn to the second of my concepts, nation. And here, of course, I'm speaking about Korea. To speak about Korea, and especially pre-20th century Korea, as a nation. And historians have been discussing this for a very long time. Some of us um, have tried to elude this question um, by simply pointing to the great coherence in cultural and linguistic terms of people who live on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and of course, this is a process that does go back a very long time, at least, at least 3,000 years. So in linguistic terms, you're going to hear a little bit about linguistics in these lectures. Not much, I promise you, but a little bit. Um, in linguistic terms, modern Korean derives from Middle Korean, which in turn derives from, you guessed it, Old Korean, which has its roots, linguists believe, in some form of Proto-Korea. So not much change there. Actually, great change in terms of language, but not much change in terms of an overall departure, moving in a different direction. So there is something that's been going on for a very long time here that one needs to think about. China is not like that. Japan also is not like that, or at least not quite in the same way. Uh, so in this sense, within its own region, Korea is quite unique. But of course, looking at it this way is a typical historian's cop-out. Right? You say that something exists because it's always existed and then you can't quite describe what it is. So I'll try to get a little bit closer to the issue than that. Now, the point is, of course, that not everything that is distinct becomes a nation in any meaningful sense of the term. Well, certainly not a nation before historians uh, started inventing nations in Europe in the 19th century. It's about defining who is out. you know, who the nation, who, who does not belong um, with the nation. So what then about East Asia and, and what about Korea? Now, there are people who argue, and I'm going to talk more about this in a little bit, that Korean concepts of nation is something that go far back in time. Not using the term nation, uh, not necessarily using principles of, of exclusion, Uh, but more in, in the form that Anthony Smith, my former colleague at LSE, defined nation as a group sharing a historic territory, common myths, and historical memories. Uh, if that is true, uh, overall as a definition, then Korea, I think, for quite some time falls into that definition. And perhaps further back than Europe in the 19th century. It is quite possible, it is quite meaningful, at least to me, to think of the form of cohesion that people living on the Korean Peninsula had created amongst themselves prior to the European influences in intellectual terms, political terms of the 19th century, as some form of nation. And then finally, the third concept, righteous. E in Chinese, or we, In, in Korean, and you see it up there, that's a good traditional, is perhaps especially in the form of 
concepts of moral fitness, all, as you will know, uh, essential parts of the Neo-Confucian creed coming out of China uh, about a thousand years ago, and taken up especially in Korea. This Neo-Confucian concept of righteousness is something that has inspired generation after generation of Koreans, elite Koreans to be sure, in order to define the content of their own state. And that goes beyond just the issue of who we are in a kind of ethnic sense. The, the concept of the Korean state as being particularly preoccupied with righteousness uh, were sometimes attacked by the Chinese for this. That again, and it is interesting how this character has become a slogan for various Korean political projects over a period at least of the 600 years that I'm talking about here. So the popular army in the uprising against the Japanese invasions in the 1580s called themselves the Righteous Army, or Uibyo. And you will find it in the resistance against Japan in the 20th century, and you find it in numerous political upheavals in South Korea towards the end of the 20th century. So it is a significant concept. Now, in terms of breaking points, for this whole region that we are talking about here, in the spirit of Ambassador Russia, uh, there is probably no more important breaking point than the late 14th century. First, the Ming Empire um, in the 1360s, and then the Choson Empire or, uh, in, in Korea in 1380s and, 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 and 1390s. But if the Ming was a great project, Joseon in Korea was even more of a project was even more of a break with the past and an attempt to put something new in its place. It was not an entire break with Korea's past. It built on Korea's past to quite some extent. But it was an attempt at refining, finessing, and first and foremost, ordering uh, the way the state behaved. It was nothing less than the remaking of Korean society according to the principles of Neo-Confucianism. In a very authoritarian, led by the elites, very, very hierarchical, but crucially, and this is what is different from almost any other Neo-Confucian projects across East Asia, there were many of them, based on the voluntary or involuntary participation of almost everyone within Korean society. And that was, I think, because it turned out to be a very successful project. That's what gave it such deep roots. Of course, there were groups that were excluded from any concept of Confucian rectitude. Uh, Korea was a caste system. It was a slaveholding system, which I'll talk about. But among the people who had some form of franchise in terms of participation, this was expected to be, to be universal. So I said that this was a successful project. And I do believe that it really, but because it was able to imprint itself so deeply on the population that it, it ruled. And it was successful also in another sense. It, it created a state that had a great deal of capacity in various forms. And this is something that's often forgotten when we talk about Korea during these years, mainly its relationship with Ming and Qing empires. One tends to forget the ability of Korean rulers to cling on to power. To, to have a, a successful state that continued for a very long period of time. Socially unjust, as it was, as I already alluded to, and with enormous problems um, in terms of at least some aspects of, of innovation. The best example, I think, of its successfulness on its own terms was that it survived the biggest challenge of its time, of this first period that we are talking about, which was the great East Asian wars of the late 16th and early 17th century. So what you could call East Asia's World War, first with the Japanese uh, attempt under Toyotomi Hideyoshi at taking over Korea and possibly also having in mind taking over the significant parts of Ming China, and then Qing attempts uh, at controlling Korea, the Yuchun, Manchu, Qing attempts at controlling Korea in the 1620s and the 1630s. Uh, for a region that saw itself as a world, quite rightly, this was a world war. And it was an enormously testing experience for all the polities that were involved.
two of them didn't survive. And surprisingly enough, the one who did was Korea, was Joseon Korea. Ming collapsed, uh, Hideyoshi experiment went nowhere, ended in, in, in tears and defeat. Joseon was the one that survived. And that says something about the internal cohesion that was there. The ability to survive disasters when inflicted on the country. Possibly also, and this is something I'd love for us to discuss later on, because the concept of state was slightly different. Maybe for the very reason that Korea was not an empire, uh, was it possible to get some, some kind of continuity beyond this? 네, 오늘 영상 봐주셔서 감사하고 다음 영상에서 또 뵙도록 하겠습니다. 구독, 좋아요, 알람 설정 정말 큰 힘이 됩니다. 꼭꼭 부탁드리고 항상 건강 유의하시고 아주 좋습니다.